I'm going to share with you what I have found to be the most flexible and efficient way to draw the figure from life. Hey guys, what's up? I'm back with another figure drawing video and today I want to share with you this method that I employ and that I teach in my classes that I feel is really flexible and adjustable for working from life. This is a really good method if you have maybe two or three hours to do your drawing. This is not necessarily the method that I would use in gesture poses. I mean, definitely not for gesture poses. You just don't have time. Um, but even for like just a 20 minute pose, it can be a stretch to do something like this. Um, so this is really great when you have two hours, three hours, a uh, good amount of time that you can pay attention to angles and proportions and spend a good amount of time shading. With this method, we're using a really dark uh, gray paper, so not a light gray. You want it to be a medium value so that the white really pops off of the paper. Uh, but using that darker gray paper and both black and white charcoal is what really makes this method flexible. So if you're just drawing on plain white paper, it's really hard to erase it all the way back to white. Uh, so you have to be really careful. Having both the black and the white charcoal and using it a little bit more like paint and a little bit less like a plain drawing material gives you the opportunity to cover up some of what you don't want to show. So if you put something dark in the light area and then you decided you needed to change the shape, you can end up going over that with white charcoal and that will obscure the previous image of what you had there. So it's really just more malleable. It's almost like a clay type of a feeling rather than just um, just drawing and hoping that you don't make a mistake. So I change my mind all the time when I'm using this method and that's what I really love about it. You don't have to be perfect from the get-go. You just keep making the drawing better as you go along. I'm gonna talk a little bit about materials here and what I use. Um, in this particular video, I did not start off with vine or willow charcoal. Sometimes I'm just lazy and it wasn't already in my, um, my little sketch box here, so I didn't go and get any. Uh, but often I will start with vine or willow because it erases super easily. Once you move on to compressed charcoal, it doesn't erase as easily, so I definitely recommend that. Make all your beginning estimations in the vine or the willow charcoal so that you can erase and hide your mistakes later. I used a stick of compressed charcoal and I used General's uh, charcoal for that. I'm not sure what hardness it was. I don't really pay a lot of attention. Um, I just gave it a good coating at first in the shadow area with that. Sometimes I'll just use the pencils for that initial coating. Uh, Credit Color also makes a uh, charcoal like stick. It's maybe five or six millimeters and it has a nice wooden holder. So sometimes I'll use that one too. But regardless of if I use the Vine or the Willow charcoal and if I use a stick of compressed charcoal when I start or not, I always move on to these General's charcoal pencils. I use the hard, the medium, and the white charcoal pencils from General's Charcoal. Um, I like their charcoal because it doesn't seem to have a sticky binder in it. There are some other brands that if you start to build up layers of the charcoal, it like gets kind of sticky and then you can't erase it and you can't put anything more on top of it and it's kind of weird. The General's Charcoal, um, it doesn't get that way. The reason that I stick with just the hard and the medium is because I use an electric pencil sharpener to sharpen my pencils and the soft and the extra soft ones just always break in the sharpener. And like I said earlier, I'm a little lazy, so I'm not gonna take the time and carve the wood off and sand it down and all that kind of stuff. Um, because in addition to being lazy, I'm super clumsy, so I'm probably gonna drop it and break the point after spending, you know, like 30 minutes getting the perfect pencil tip. So instead, I just stick with the hard, the medium, and the white. They sharpen really nicely if you have a good electric pencil sharpener. And if I need a softer charcoal than that, instead of like bothering myself with the soft and the extra soft pencils that constantly break, I just go and I get a stick of soft charcoal and I can sharpen that if I want to. It's a lot easier, just use some sandpaper and get a nice point on that without having to like carve all the wood off of the pencil. I've got a good old kneaded eraser. Sometimes I use a stick eraser and um, maybe when I use that in a video, I'll talk more about that in another video. 
uh, but I didn't use it in this one. And then I've got my trusty fluffy brush. And this was just something, it's a Blick Economy watercolor brush. Uh, and I got it, you know, on clearance or something like that at some point. But I think a makeup brush would work. You just want it to be nice and, and fluffy. So I used that for some blending and then just a paper towel for some of my initial blending. The paper is a Daler Brownie Canford card. Uh, I also use their Canford paper, same thing, just thinner. And I use the uh, gunmetal version. Basically, you know, I recommend to my students when you're looking for paper, think about the value of the paper. How light or dark is it? Because you want the white to be able to pop off of it, at least with this particular technique. And then I also suggest look at the texture of your paper and think, do you like the texture? For example, the Canson uh, Metientes has one side that has this kind of mechanical pattern on it. It's almost like chicken pox, like little round divots in the paper. And then the other side has some tooth, but not really a mechanical texture like that. So I personally like the back side of it because I don't like the mechanical texture showing up in my drawing. And I don't like how it kind of obscures the uh, pencil mark. Uh, so yeah, just look for a good sturdy paper with a good value on it, whatever color it is, and uh, make sure that you like it, just that you enjoy the qualities of the paper and give it a shot. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna get to the demo portion of this. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. If you find this helpful, give me a like, give me a subscribe, and let's get to it. Okay, so basically what I have here is a three-step process. This is the first uh, step in that process where I'm just using straight lines to block in the contour around the outside of the figure and the light and shadow division or the terminator. So I'm using just straight lines and eventually they start to look like curves because if you overlap enough straight lines, they begin to um, look like curves but I'm making a whole bunch of angle comparisons there. You can see like between the shoulder and the hip, um, between the waist and the other hip, and all these other parts that are not connected. The second part of the process you can see here, and it's gonna just fly by, it's just filling in the shadow half and the light half. Is If light's touching it, it gets a coat of white. If light's not touching it, it gets a coat of black charcoal, and then I move along after smearing it. So the reason that I smear things is so that it gives you a chance to change your mind. Since everything is out of focus, you don't feel married to all those lines that you made right at the beginning, and you can go ahead and make adjustments, and it doesn't feel like you're just totally doing everything over. So typically, uh, what I will do is look in the shadows for darker areas and use black charcoal to make them darker. And then I'll start building up the light area with the white. So I usually wait a little bit before I start putting black charcoal into the light area. And you can see I'm starting to do it there where I'm working um, near the terminator on the hip. And I'm dragging out a little bit of half tone into the light area. Um, but usually before that, I will go in and start to make the shadow areas darker, which I had done there. Before I started with the half tone, I made the core of that form shadow a little bit darker. So basically, I don't want to start throwing any white into the shadow area, and I don't want to start erasing into the shadow area unless I'm making a correction or something, because the whole point of doing the light half and the shadow half in the beginning is to establish that value separation. In order to have convincing form and make something look round, you need to show either light hitting the form because it's facing toward the light, or light not hitting the form and therefore not having the white uh, charcoal in there because the surface is facing away from the light. If you start to erase too much in the shadow or throw a bunch of white into the shadow, that can just destroy that form and start to make things look a little bit more flat. So that's why I focus on really building darker areas into the shadows and that way I can show reflected light still uh, but without destroying the form. So um, I'm putting in some background in this and doing some hair, which actually that needs its own tutorial. But if we're looking at the figure, 
one of the things that I really like to start to exaggerate is the differences in edges between cast shadows and form shadows. So right now the shadow that's on her hip all the way across her hips and the shadow that's on her arm and a little bit of the shadow that's on her back um, are form shadows but the one that I just started working on there a second ago with the really sharp edge that's on the shoulder that she is leaning on that is a cast shadow the chair was casting a little bit of shadow onto her um, also there's a cast shadow on her torso on the upper side where her arm is casting a bit of a shadow there so those shadows get to be darker than all the rest of the shadows and they also have a crisper edge so there's not a bunch of half tone um, spilling out of that shadow there near the chair um, so I'm building up the highlights and you'll notice that I'm making a lot of marks that go around the form I did start off with some mark directions on those highlights that go along the form instead of around it and um, since I'm getting toward the end of the drawing now I'm going ahead and putting just a tiny bit of white into the shadows, uh, really not enough to make it very much lighter, but I was more doing it to try and control the uh, appearance of the surface and to get some marks in there as well. I also uh, put in some details on the spine there, but you know, I like to keep things as simple as possible and not get too carried away with the details. Sometimes you can end up making a drawing just look like an anatomical model or like a drawing of a flayed cadaver rather than a human when you're focused too much on the details and not enough on the overall form that unites everything. Uh, so don't forget there are bones and muscles here but there's this layer of skin over everything unifying it so if you go in and you put in a lot of details you may want to literally use your marks to go over the top of the entire light area or the entire shadow area and um, and unify those you'll see too that I had a little bit of a fluffy brush here it's a watercolor brush but a makeup brush works well um, so you can go ahead and employ that and that's the three-step process step one use straight lines and angles. Step two, shade in the light half and the shadow half, and then smear it. And step three, build up your values on the shadow and the light side, but while maintaining the separation between values. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions at all about this process. Give me a like or a subscribe if you find this content useful and you wanna see more of it in the future and I will see you again soon.